Well, we'll kick off. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today and welcome to our Richmond Birdwing Butterfly webinar brought to you by the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland and the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network. We're pretty glad you could join us today. This is um, this is going to be a pretty fun webinar to present and um, saddened only by the fact that we've got one hour as a time slot. We could probably talk about, or I could talk about Richmond Birdwing Butterflies and the um, the birdwing butterfly vine for hours on end. It's it's a very interesting topic, uh, but we'll do our best to s keep it nice and, and tight for everybody. My name is Matt Cecil. I'm the project manager at Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland, and part of my job involves looking after projects for the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network. It's one of my most favourite um, tasks to do. Uh, some housekeeping, though, for some of you um, who are listen listening to this as a recording. Um, thank you for, for listening to the recording. For those of you listening live, um, a recording of this webinar plus all the PowerPoint slides will be available via our Wildlife Queensland website at the events and talking wildlife webinars section from the webpage. And for registrants, you'll also be emailed a link um, straight to that page so it's nice and easy for you to follow up and have another look at it um, later on. Um, if you have any questions for myself or for our two guest presenters during this webinar, you can uh, write those in the Q&A section, which you'll find down the bottom of your screen. And please do that at any time during the presentation so you don't forget your question. We'll address all of our questions at the end of the, the presentation. Um, and both of our panelists and myself will answer any that we need to. If there's too many questions to get through during the time, uh, then we will certainly continue to answer those questions and type out a response and include that um, in the events section for this particular webinar. So don't don't be too worried if we don't get to your question live on air. We still most certainly will answer it for you. Um, it's very important though that we we are in the spirit of reconciliation, Wildlife Queensland and the Richmond Birdman Conservation Network acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Alrighty. So my two guest speakers today, I'll, I'll read their bios for you. Um, we have Dr Ian Ginther, who's a Senior Conservation Officer with Threatened Species Research and Monitoring in the Department of Environment and Science. He's also a research Honorary Research Fellow in the Vertebrate Section Biodiversity and Geosciences Program at the Queensland Museum. As well as involved, his involvement with captive rearing and release of the Richmond Birdwing Butterfly, Ian has extensive experience in surveying vertebrate species across Queensland. He has led or participated in conservation and monitoring programs for a range of threatened bird species and mammals, um, including the Cox and Fixed Parrot, Rufus Scrubbird, Silver-Headed Antichinus, Black-Tailed Dusky Antichinus, Yellow-Footed Rock Wallaby, New Holland Mouse, Hastings River Mouse, and the Water Mouse. Uh, and Ian is extremely knowledgeable on all things birdwing butterflies and captive rearing, and that'll be a fantastic presentation to hear from. Well, we're also going to hear from Richard Bull, who's a committee member of the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network. Um, and Richard has been an entomologist his entire working career. Um, started out with the Bureau of Sugar Experiment Station here in Bundaberg in Queensland, um, and has fallen in love with birdwing butterflies on a research trip to Papua New Guinea. Um, incidentally, R Richard was the very first paid up member of the Richmond Birdwing Recovery Network back in the early 90s. So you, you can appreciate that Richard's commitment to this particular subject um, is deep and his passion for the birdwing and the vines uh, runs strong. And he's a, one of the extremely hardworking retiree and a, a real gentleman. So I'm sure you'll um, appreciate listening to Richard's presentation today. The topic I guess we're talking about is the Richmond Birdwing butterfly itself and the, the Birdwing butterfly vine. Um, both of them are mutually inclusive, you can't talk about one without the other. But uh, in overall, the Richmond Birdwing Recovery Network and now the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network are uh, just fine a fine example and a, and a really fantastic model of a species recovery program. It involves the general community, it requires and needs the general community to help out. There's lots of science that's gone into the recovery of this species, and there's also government participation and inclusion in the project. So getting those three ingredients together has been key and has really saved this particular species. From what I understand, early work on the conservation of this animal revolved around community awareness, letting everybody know that this species was out there and that it was suffering and needed help. 
and engaging the community to show them exactly how it is they can help and that was simply by um, growing vines. A lot of work had to go into how best to cultivate the vines and getting those skills into the uh, various nurseries to make bulk vines available for planting but getting the general community in, involved in looking for bird wings and planting vines for the past 30 years has been a huge step in this particular recovery. Now it's, it's uh, it still continues along that vein. We still work on community awareness and having the community plant vines, but the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network and Wildlife Queensland now really spend a lot of time on strategic corridors. So, you know, connecting isolated birdwing populations, planning 20 years ahead to try to get the Richmond Birdwing butterfly population back to its glory days. Um, without further ado, though, I guess I'd like to welcome our first speaker for the day, Dr. Ian Ginther. Um, as we spoke about on this particular project, Dr. Ginther works hard with threatened species uh, department in, in the Department of Environment Science to um, to build a captive reared population of rich and birding butterflies to uh, enhance the genetic variability of wild populations. But I'll can, I'll stop talking. I'll let Ian tell you all about it. Over to you, Ian. Thanks very much, Matt. I hope you can hear me okay. Hopefully you can all see that presentation. So um, what I'd like to do is to introduce you to the Richmond Birdwing, firstly by illustrating what a thing of beauty they are, but then also to show the adults uh, and clearly show the difference between the two sexes, uh, which is um, quite marked. Um, I'll then give you uh, an overview of the species distribution, its life cycle and ecology, before going on to describe some of the threats this species is facing. And finally, as Matt's indicated, I'll provide a quick rundown on the Department of Environment and Science project that I've been involved in, which uses captive breeding and release to improve recovery prospects for the Richmond birdwing. So firstly, to look at the butterflies, they are big and spectacular and extremely eye-catching. The males in particular are colorful. This is the upper wing shot showing beautiful emerald greens and velvet black uh, on, the, on the upper side and the bright yellow abdomen. What the females lack in color and pattern, I guess they make up for in size because they are clearly a much larger insect uh, and these are spectacularly sized butterflies. Uh, the undersides of the female are quite similar, but it's a little bit different for the males. I think even more exquisitely marked than on the upper side really, very delicate patterning of, of multiple colors. So they're as spectacular as they are, they're actually not Australia's biggest uh, butterflies. As you can see in this map, this shows that there are actually three different bird wing butterflies of the genus Ornithoptera in Australia. The ones uh, marked in red there at the top of Queensland, um, sometimes called the Cape York bird wing, but probably more accurately called New Guinea bird wing, because although it occurs in Queensland and the Torres Strait Islands, as you can see there, most of the distribution of, the, of this species, Ornithoptera priamus, occurs in the New Guinea archipelago uh, and around in islands of Indonesia and out of the Solomons. In the green, it shows the familiar Cairns birdwing that people in the wet tropics know so well, but it also has a distribution that extends down to the Mackay with Sunday coast down to as far as Serena. In the purple there at the bottom is the Richmond birdwing, which is actually the smallest of the three. Um, and it has a classic subtropical distribution based around those subtropical rainforests of southeast Queensland and far northeastern New South Wales. So to talk about life cycle, as for any insect with direct or indirect development, sorry, it has the classic four stages um, in life from adult, egg, larva and pupa. Uh, in moths and butterflies, the larva is typically called caterpillar. So that's a term you will hear used interchangeably. And in butterflies, the, the pupa often forms a very hard outer casing to keep it protected. And that's sometimes called a chrysalis. So you can hear those terms both used for the pupa, pupa and chrysalis. So to consider the life stages in a little bit more detail, the eggs that Richmond, Richmond bird wings lay or the females lay are on the undersides of the food plant. And I'll come back to the food plant in, a, in more detail later on. But the eggs are big and bright yellow and uh, quite obvious. 
when you look for them, usually laid singly on a leaf uh, when conditions are good and there's plenty of um, soft new leaf material for the adult females to lay on. Where that soft leaf material is limited, you might end up getting multiple eggs laid on individual leaves. Those eggs take about a week to hatch. What emerges is a, an adult, uh, sorry, is a larva called um, a first instar. So the larvae go through five, typically five stages um, of development from the smallest to the largest, molting in between. So those stages can be called instars. So the first instar that emerges from the egg is only about two millimeters long. Uh, so it's tiny and quite vulnerable and hungry because the first thing it does is eat the eggshell that it just emerged from, as you can see at the top right. As they progressively molt, they're able to eat harder and harder leaves uh, until you get to the fifth instar, which can be a big chunky grub, 75 millimeters long or so. Uh, and they eat quite a, lot of, um, quite a lot of hard leaf with their much harder mandibles. So during development, which can take anywhere between 25 and 50 days, depending on temperatures and nutrition, um, those larvae can eat something up to a square meter of leaf each. So they are voracious. And if you have planted vines, they're going to be destroying lots of them, which is the whole purpose of planting the vines in the first place. So once the, uh, the fifth instar has finished eating, feels like it has enough and wants to just get ready to pupate, mm -hmm. it finds the underside of a leaf uh, that's suitable and spins uh, a silk mat on the underside, completely covering that surface. And then it attaches its, the tip of its abdomen to that silk mat and spins this intriguing harness, a silk harness that it wraps around what will become the thorax of the insect and it lies back and suspends itself in there. Apparently dormant and this lasts for several days but in inside there's massive cellular reorganization going on and the pupa is actually forming. So after several days the skin of that uh, old larval stage splits and it molts to reveal the chrysalis underneath. Now what's interesting about the chrysalis or the pupa of Richmond birdwing is that it's bright green, which makes it hard to find in the forest. And that's very different from the two northern birdwings, which have um, brown pupae or chrysalises. So the metamorphosis to an adult can take around about a month, a little bit less, a bit more uh, in the spring and summer period. That usually depends on temperature and um, how much food uh, the larval stage is consumed. Um, in the, uh, the winter time though, the uh, metamorphosis takes much longer. And so it's intriguing that any larva that enters a pupal stage in, in autumn will actually enter what's called pupal diapause. It's a form of suspended animation where they're actually able to spend the whole winter in that form, uh, just as a pupa. And that's how they, in fact, the species survives over winter and then is able to emerge the following spring. Sometimes it emerges or much later than spring and it can be up to 300 days before um, the adults emerge. So you can tell when the pupa is about to, um, to split open and the adult emerge because the color uh, of the skin or the color of the butterfly becomes apparent through the thin skin, the thin wall of the, of the chrysalis. You can see in the top right, you can start to make out blacks and greens of the, um, of the wings underneath. So it's at this stage, you can actually start to take a punt on whether you've got male or female, judging by the, the colors you can see. When it eventually does pupate, uh, sorry, it does uh, eclose or emerge, eclosion is the term for that, uh, the skin of the, uh, the pupa splits along the dorsal surface and a soft adult emerges uh, with fully functional legs, but the wings, unfortunately, are very soft, crumpled and uh, very small. So the next period is vital for um, a proper development of the adult. They must hang somewhere quietly and safely and spend up to an hour and a half or so pumping blood into the wings to get them to fully expand into their uh, natural size. And then those wings must harden. If there are any creases or crumples or any defects, uh, that butterfly won't be able to, to fly and it's unfortunately game over. So this is a very vital stage and the, and the bird wings are, are quite uh, susceptible uh, at that stage. So when a male emerges from a pupa like that, it must wait several days before it can um, be considered sexually mature. Females on the other hand are actually sexually mature uh, right from eclosion. So 
they are in fact fair game for any male that happens to be nearby uh, or waiting for them to emerge. So mating can occur almost immediately that they come out from, um, from the pupil case. This shows mating of much older adults, as you can see by the tatty wings. But um, once they've mated and the females then develop eggs, they can start laying in a few days and that whole life cycle continues again. So to continue on with ecology, you generally see adults flying between about late August and May, although in the last four or five years, we've been witnessing adults flying beyond that period, almost into winter, in fact, into June and sometimes early July, which has been quite unusual. They generally occur from sea level right all the way up to the highest ranges in Southeast Queensland and Northeast New South Wales. So that's the McPherson range, the Lamington Plateau area and also across in the border into New South Wales where the border ranges are, nightcap ranges and those areas. In the lowlands and the mid altitudes, there's usually three generations occurring a year. Um, and they didn't always occur at high altitude every year, but they do seem to be doing that regularly now, probably a factor uh, influenced by warming of the climate. Uh, and up there, instead of one, we're now possible to get two generations happening at very high altitudes. So it's um, possibly a win for the Richmond birdwing from global warming. Males, when they emerge, tend to remain within the general area. So they tend to set up um, patrolling territories and scout for females and feed. Whereas the females, however, can disperse sometimes up to 30 kilometers. And that's an important distance that I'll come back to later when talking about our captive breeding program. Um, it's uh, a thing that's been noted that they can actually cross sometimes inhospitable terrain. So this image that the spectacular shot that Todd Burroughs took um, was, was taken from the Gold Coast Seaway where a female was fluttering into a stiff breeze crossing from the Southport side across to South Fredbrook Island. So there's very, very inhospitable terrain that's crossing there and they're quite powerful flyers. Occasionally though, when both sexes build up in numbers, they can migrate uh, en masse to, to new locations and sometimes spill down into places where they're not normally seen on the western side of the Great Divide. So the females must sustain themselves on nectar for, to, uh, to keep going, to keep their energy levels up. And that can come from a diverse range of flowering trees and shrubs and other plants. And that list on the right is, is not nearly exhaustive probably, but it gives a, a smattering of the, the species that, um, that the species can obtain that nectar from. So they're not at all fussy. They're also attracted to blooms of some exotic garden plants. And that's probably led to the, the popularity of the species increasing because who wouldn't want this, this butterfly fluttering around your garden, feeding on your plants. Um, just as an example of the sorts of things they, they like to feed on, Creams, white flowers uh, and red blossoms are, are, are typically favoured like this uh, adult female feeding on a lily pilly at, um, this one was at high ele elevation and near Lamington National Park. By contrast, the uh, larval stage is dependent wholly on one of two rainforest vines. In the lower alt altitudes, so coastal level up to sort of the foothills and lower ranges, that vine is the birdwing butterfly vine or Parastolochia prevenosa, and that's the only thing the larvae can eat. So it's the only thing the adults can lay on for successful breeding. At higher altitude in the rainforests, you'll find the mountain butterfly vine or Parastolochia leiana. Uh, it has a much smaller leaf, a very distinctly different flower, but that sustains the populations at high altitude. So the leaf resources must be sufficient up there for them to breed successfully for those one or two generations that we've been noting recently. But it's only in locations that have these two, one of, uh, of these two vines where Richmond birdwing can successfully breed and support a population. So just where are those populations? Well, as is shown in this map, the, uh, the locations of breeding has actually changed considerably over time. If you look at the yellow dots on the right hand side to start with, shows the historic breeding range actually stretched from Maryborough and River Heads uh, beside the Great Sandy Strait all the way down south across the border to the Grafton area on the Clarence River. But they are historic records, those extremes, and of recently we've 
uh, well, not recently, for the last several decades, we found that the bird wing has actually disappeared. It's contracting from the north and it's contracting northwards from the south. So that um, the, the modern limits for the species are really um, around the, the Noosa hinterland in the north and the Wardell region just south of uh, Ballina uh, in the south. Not only that, it, the species has disappeared largely from the Brisbane region. It doesn't breed here anymore, whereas it used to be quite prolific in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, and then also that it, it continued right up until probably the 60s and 70s in pockets in Brisbane. But that's, that's no longer the case. So we've not now got a situation where the distribution of the birdwing uh, bird butterfly is in a big chunk to the north of Brisbane and one to the south, starting from about the Ormo region, south into New South Wales. But within those two areas, the distribution is very fragmented and broken into subpopulations. Uh, and as I come back to, this is half the problem with, uh, with the species. So it's actually declined to the extent now that it's listed as a vulnerable species in Queensland, although not in New South Wales. So what's causing these range uh, contractions and the local extinctions of, of uh, the butterfly from these regions? Well, there are a range of threats that the species uh, faces. The uh, top right picture really shows the most uh, prevalent of those threats and that's outright loss of habitat and then fragmentation of habitat. So not only is there fewer places to live, uh, fewer food resources uh, available, but the um, the difficulty the butterfly faces in getting between patches of habitat is greatly ex exacerbated by the hostile terrain in between. And that leads to a, a phenomenon called inbreeding depression, which I'll explain a little bit more detail in the next slide. The other threats that are becoming more prevalent are things like climate change, the ongoing global warming, although it may seem to benefit the butterfly in being able to breed at higher altitudes, there's a definite uh, uh, well, a clear result that um, eggs and butterflies are very susceptible to rising temperature uh, and can actually be killed by that. And also the um, increasing temperature and drought makes the leaves that the, the caterpillars feed on much tougher and so they're less likely to be able to survive. So drought and global warming are considered major threats for the species in the future. The other thing is host plant confusion with Dutchman's pipe. Now this is actually an introduced species in the same family as the, um, the, the natural host vines, the two uh, mountain butterfly vine and the birdwing butterfly vine. But in this case, the, the leaves are actually toxic to the larvae. So once they start eating, they might get to the first or maybe even the second instar before they accumulate too many toxins and they actually die. So this is a major threat to successful reproduction. Uh, and will wipe out local colonies of butterflies if the weed escapes and becomes uh, well established. So going back to the inbreeding depression thing, as I've said, where you get isolated pockets with um, uh, small populations and less chance of butterflies moving between those, it means your genetic exchange between the local populations becomes greatly reduced. And that leads to inbreeding of those populations. And inbreeding causes a phenomenon called inbreeding depression, which manifests itself by a whole range of things in the, in the wild population. The eggs become less viable. Uh, the, the larvae can take a lot longer to develop from the first to fifth instars, and sometimes don't even make it that far, dying some, at some point in between. If they do make it to the pupil stage, sometimes those just fail and, and, and never emerge as adults. And if the adults do come, uh, emerge from those pupae. They tend to have smaller size and reduced fitness and generally have the females don't have as many uh, eggs and, and so all of those factors combined together can lead to local extinction of a population. And it's that local extinction caused by inbreeding depression that is the focus of the Department of Environment Science project that uh, I'm working on and that's where we want to use selective mating and captive rearing to combat the problem, to directly intervene, to, to counteract the effects of inbreeding depression. So the methodology we're using is to mate unrelated adults. So that means to take adults, a male and a female, from uh, areas that are great, widely separated. So more than 30 kilometers, which we know the females can fly over. So hopefully in, the, in a range of 40 kilometers or more, 
and then mate those uh, males and females so that we can get egg laying by the female. So the progeny that she will be laying will hopefully be more genetically enriched uh, than either of the two parent uh, um, generations. So we can then uh, raise those, cap those larvae that uh, result in captivity and translocate those en masse to sites where inbreeding depression has been evident or populations uh, are dwindling. So the, the whole import, the whole point of that is to is to reinvigorate uh, the declining populations, but also to reintroduce uh, butterflies to places where the habitat ostensibly looks fantastic. There's plenty of food material, but the butterflies have just disappeared because of that inbreeding depression effect. So to start captive breeding, you need founding stock. You need to get the the adults, um, or sorry, the um, the individuals that you're going to raise in captivity from somewhere. So the yellow triangles on the left hand map show where over the years we have um, collected uh, eggs and larvae is mostly what we take. Um, most of those have come from places near uh, Yandina um, and Yumundi and Sunshine Coast in the Biwai area of the Glasshouse Mountains and in the south from the Talabudra Valley or from recently from um, Hins Dam, where we've been doing some salvage operations, rescuing uh, eggs and larvae from Dutchman's pipe that has been uh, growing there. So once we get them into, um, into captivity, we need to house them somewhere. So the husbandry side of it is, is actually quite involved, but we have um, suitable enclosures to keep the insects safe. We have to have sufficient of the potted food vines that the, uh, the adults will lay on and the, and the larvae can eat. In this case, we're using uh, Parastolochia pravenosa, the, the birdwing butterfly vine, to, uh, to grow the larvae on. You've also got to look after predators, um, make sure that um, they don't make their way into the, the enclosures. And we've got to be very mindful of genetic management. We don't want siblings mating with each other because that defeats the point of, um, of the project we're doing. So as I mentioned, we wanted stock from different genetic sources. So as well as this uh, flight enclosure that we have um, set up at the David Flay Wildlife Park at West Burley on the Gold Coast, there's another facility in Brisbane that we use for rearing eggs and larvae through the pupil stage. This is not by any means um, predator proof. And so here we have to use these special mesh um, sleeves with Velcro attachments for, um, for rearing the larvae safely. So once we get, um, get them through to pupil stage by carefully managing the food resources and moving larvae around if particular uh, vines are being munched too much, um, we can then have stock that will hopefully then emerge as adults for the mating purposes that we want, the selective mating that we'd like to do. Adults uh, though, before they mate, or they will mate, but before they lay eggs, they have to be well fed, well nourished. So feeding the captive butterflies is, um, is a major part of the husbandry. We either give them cut vine, uh, sorry, cut flowers, or they feed themselves on potted uh, plants in the enclosures. Um, but it's more effective to give them artificial nectar sources, which sometimes they have to be taught as is happening on the left. But after that point, they can really feed themselves once they are familiar with the location of the nectar source in the enclosure. For mating purposes, uh, we select the males and females from the, uh, the founder stock that, that we want. Uh, and we found it now more effective to do manual mating. It takes the romance out of it for the butterflies, but uh, by hand mating, we can actually be sure that um, the male and the female that we want to mate are uh, coupled. And after that initial coupling by hand, um, they usually hang safely on a leaf somewhere in the enclosure for one to two hours uh, before disengaging. And the female then spends a few days uh, before she's able to lay eggs. So it's that next generation that is more genetically enriched because of the, um, the different genetic stock in the parents that uh, is the key to our project. So that F1 generation uh, is very valuable to us and we've carefully raised that up until it's about mid-stage development or sometimes later stage when the larvae are a bit more robust and then we can actually release them to the wild at our selected sites. Um, typically we try to do this in batches of 30 or 40 at a time which is a, a really good cohort size to go out into the forest um, and we choose places where um, there's plenty of food vine available for them 
Um, but it's also got protected tenure and that's important so that the, we can be guaranteed there won't be any damage to the, the vines or the, the larvae uh, during development. So they go off immediately that we let them go, very often start feeding straight away uh, and then they're able to choose their own site for pupation and uh, continue on with their life cycle. So these uh, orange blobs on the left show the sites that we have done translocations uh, in the time since it began in 2010. Um, and and um, they have been, the first, the first translocations were targeted at Katharabar in the very north of the range of the existing range because um, there were food vines there, the habitat was wonderful, but the butterflies had disappeared. They had probably not been seen in that area since the early 2000s. And so these were the first uh, reintroductions uh, back to an area where they had become locally extinct. Since then, we have done other reintroductions to places like um, Newham Creek Conservation Park near Woodford, uh, areas south of Coulomb. Um, but also we have done supplementations where there's been signs that populations of butterflies are actually dwindling. Uh, and so you can see in total, we've done uh, translocations all the way down to Burley Heads and Talabajara Valley. This uh, just shows the details of where these translocations have happened in that period, uh, with a total now of nearing 500 individuals released to the wild uh, to do their thing. Now, what's the results of all that been? Well, the good news is that after long ab absences at some locations, Richmond bird wings are again being seen flying uh, and laying eggs and um, and getting on with life in places that they have been absent for a very long time. So at Katharabar, the bird, bird wings were seen uh, the, the following uh, summer breeding season from our reintroductions uh, and have been seen there ever since, right up until this year. Um, and they were seen in really good numbers. And these were the first records actually after that reintroduction for 17 years at that location. The other thing is that they've started to radiate away from the initial release site and have been seen at distances as up to 20 kilometers away from where they were first released at new locations that hadn't had uh, Richmond birdwing adults or larvae recorded previously. So that's a very positive sign that they are dispersing uh, and finding uh, natural habitat and food resources for themselves. So that monitoring that we try to do annually has revealed ongoing breeding at those sites where we've done releases, which has been a very encouraging. Also where we've done supplementations of, of uh, existing populations, the anecdotal reports from members of the public and people like Richard have really been encouraging. And they've, they've claimed to have seen uh, greater numbers of bird wings in the areas immediately around those, um, those release sites. It is anecdotal, we don't have hard evidence, but it at least suggests that um, these supplementation releases are also having a desired effect. So the currently, uh, so currently the, the project is in a pause phase because the uh, facility we're using for a flight enclosure at David Flame Wildlife Park is becoming less um, biosecure. We're getting more incursions of ants, uh, and spiders, geckos and things which are uh, able to prey on various life stages of the birdwing. So with the generous donations of time, money and uh, a lot of assistance from SEQ Water, uh, and here, that's um, Thomas, sorry, Mitchell Thomas Carr from uh, SEQ Water, standing with Jackie Seal from, from David Flair Wildlife Park. We're developing and refurbishing uh, an existing enclosure to make it purpose, um, well, a better repurposed for, for Richmond birdwing breeding. It has now three banks, or will have three banks, uh, breeding enclosures there, which will allow us to better control males and females, so keep them separate. Uh, and also allow us to, to um, separate genetic stock if we have uh, different stock in the one enclosure. So we're at the final th stages of putting the, the, the finishing touches to this facility uh, and that's uh, going to be an exciting prospect for the future. So the next steps from here are to restart the captive breeding program that has been in a hiatus period for a little while, um, obtain more founders so we can get the, the uh, captive breeding going and include in that at least some um, individuals from populations with different genetics than those we've used previously. And that'll allow us to continue our uh, efforts to outbreed or um, cross the um, uh, adults from, from different 
uh, genetic sources and that way we'll have young uh, available to boost the genetic uh, diversity of the species in the wild. And we hope to con continue that um, monitoring at, at translocation sites to make sure things are on track and doing as we hope. The other thing we are really keen to do is to encourage and support the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network, local governments, the many conservation groups, bush care groups, land care groups, and the general community to continue planting vines to expand available food resources for the Richmond Birdwing, because that will allow us to naturally reconnect the isolated subpopulations of this butterfly so that they can, um, can find their own way between those remnant patches of habitat themselves. So this is a vital cog in the, um, the whole plan for um, the recovery of the, of the bird wing. What we're doing with the captive breeding and release program is great, but we only ever saw it as a short-term stopgap measure. The long-term success uh, of recovery will depend on continued planting. And so that's why we're very keen to see it go, continue on. There are many, many people to thank because of the um, uh, incredible generation, generosity and um, time and effort uh, and providing access uh, to their land in a project like this. And that just lists some of the people involved. Um, but uh, it's been a tremendous effort by a lot of people over many years and uh, there's too many really to thank. So there's some contact details for me if you'd like to get in touch after this seminar. Thanks everybody. Thanks very much Ian and um, I don't think we could have had a, a more eloquent and succinct overview of the Richmond Birdwing butterfly itself and of the conservation needs you know, of this poor threatened species and, um, and I'm and the, the, the anecdotal evidence of the success of the, the genetic work that you've been doing is fantastic. And I look forward to any, um, any future uh, genetic substitution um, on this species. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce you all now to Richard Bull. And I think I probably um, butchered Richard's bio at the beginning of this presentation um, and did no justice to your entomology knowledge and knowledge of birdwing butterflies in general. So I apologize for that, Richard, but uh, however, I'll, um, I'll cease jibber jabbering and I'll let you, everybody listen, um, listen to you about the birdwing butterfly vine. Well, thank you, Matt, and good morning, everybody. I'm uh, talking to you from the sodden top of Mount Tambourine. We've had 660 millimeters in the last four days. And all I can say is, thank goodness the sun's out today. So uh, yes, it's looking good and growing conditions for our vines will be fantastic from now on. So uh, we've had a big planting recently and uh, this will be benefiting greatly. So without further ado, let's have a look in, at my subject. I'm going to talk to you about uh, propagation and cultivation of the uh, birdwing butterfly vine, that's Paris Lochia pravenosa, the lowland one, which is the main one that is the, the, the full thrust of our uh, uh, corridor uh, construction and, uh, and various uh, plantings all around the southeast Queensland. So, if I can just get it to... Move on, hopefully it will, but it doesn't want to move. Aha, uh -huh. right, now we're away, thank you. Um, okay, just as the background, Ian's really covered this very nicely, but um, um, just to whisk over it, the um, Paris Lokia Provenosa uh, is the one that we're using all through our, um, most of our recovery um, projects. And it's uh, a native of uh, southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales, as Ian pointed out. And the up, but of course, we do have the um, the mountain species uh, in my area, um, just to the uh, south of here. Mount Tambourine doesn't actually have any left that I'm we're aware of since the clearing of the top of the mountain, but uh, from um, uh, Beachmont up through the uh, Lamington Plateau and the border ranges, that's where the Lahiana occurs. And uh, But we'll be talking about the um, Pravenosa from here on. So propagation of the seed is a very important thing. Um, in fact, uh, seed collection is, is, is the, the, um, the whole crux of getting all of these plants out for the butterfly to uh, move into new territory, 
go in through corridors or into backyards where it's never been before. So um, uh, we've looked at all the different propagation methods. We found that cuttings were very difficult to strike and they are very slow growing. Um, I'm currently involved with a uh, very innovative nurseryman and we're looking at tissue culture and we've actually got it underway already and hopefully as it uh, progresses we may have a very lucrative um, or very productive I should say source of um, many many vines in a hurry. Uh, tissue culture is a very effective one but we will have to have a look at the varieties that or the um, any differences in, in varietal um, characteristics that we're using. So this is something that we're looking at and shall be ongoing. Now RBCN has been um, looking for and having to have at least 20,000 seeds per year to keep up with the demand for the various uh, numbers of um, vines that nurserymen, um, environmental groups, and uh, various other body councils and so on are wanting to access for planting out in their projects. So it's a big demand to, um, to find 20,000 seeds per year. And uh, what I've done is um, uh, we, back in 2010, we um, decided to have a seed bank and I put my hand up for it and I've been looking after that ever since. So we do have a, um, a requirement for these seeds uh, throughout the year. And I'll talk about that later on. But one of the problems with um, the seeds is that the vine is very erratic in the um, production of seeds. Um, you can have good and bad years and some years when none, no seed is set at all. It's, it's quite amazing. Drought is very severe. The pods may develop, but then they are shed by the vine. Um, if the, uh, the conditions of uh, moisture get so low that they become stressed, um, and this has happened over the last several years, which has depleted our um, seed bank considerably almost to zero at the moment. The other aspect is that pollination is um, very specialised. We don't know much about pollination. Don Sands, the um, CSIRO, um, ret retired CSIRO entomologist that has been the backbone of the um, Richmond Bird Ring recovery projects, um, did look at that and he found that there were certain midges that um, had, were occasionally found inside the, the, uh, the, the uh, flowers of the uh, Pravenosa. Um, and, but when you look at the, um, the flower itself, it doesn't have a scent that we can detect. So it's, it doesn't um, use um, ordinary scent to attract uh, pollinators. Um, it, you never see anything going to it. The butterfly is not interested in it in, at all. It's only um, very specialized insects. We've got to look at this. Um, there's a research program that's being done by UQ that um, hopefully might provide some information about pollinators. And we may be able to do something to help these pollinators give us more successful um, uh, production of uh, seed pods. On top of that, the viability of seeds is very unreliable. They um, uh, notorious for um, slow germination. Um, only a small percentage can come up quite often. It's very seldom that you get a, a real flush of germination when you plant a, a seed tray out. And um, <clears throat> on top of that, when the seedlings emerge, uh, you have a lot of problems with um, uh, damping off fungus and, and related um, fungal diseases that attack the, uh, the very young seedling at that susceptible stage. And if um, water is, um, you know, they get too damp and overwatered and that sort of thing, or not watered enough. So it's a, it's a very tricky little um, plant to try and uh, to propagate. And on, when when you even get them back into a into a pot, the the, the disturbance of the root can often put them into shock, and um, they just won't. They just sit there for two years and do nothing. So um, <laughs> we've got a few problems growing these things. Okay, well Ian showed you what they look like, but um, there's Cravenosa on the left and Lehiana on the right. And just an interesting point about the pollination is that you notice the flowers are like a little um, saxophone, I guess you could, is the nearest um, analogy I could make. And it has this long um, throat going down to the basal um, 
cell where the where the reproductive organs are and, and where pollination would occur. But in the throat of that flower are incurved hairs, and the pollinator that, that is attracted, these little midges, have uh, evidently go in, and the incurved hairs prevent them escaping for about 24 hours. But after about 24 hours, the hairs wither, and they can go out, and then they can go to another um, vine and another flower and do the same thing and transfer pollen to get pollination. So that's you can see that the specialization of this um, pollination system is um, so extreme that um, if there's some interruption to these pollinators uh, moving about or, or being bred, whether they come out of leaf litter or whatever, um, it can affect the, the, the seed production so, um, so greatly. So um, how did we get around these problems? Well, basically we reverted because of the um, uh, uh, cuttings not being suitable, um, a suitable form for propagation. And incidentally, I should mention that the um, collection of seed from wild uh, vines is being a protected species is prohibited. And uh, of course, taking cuttings off a wild vine. So we have to rely completely on cultivated vines, people, those that people have got growing in their backyards, and then it's it's quite free and open then, so no problem. So we're relying on these people, and um, to send in to me um, large quantities of um, pods or as many as they can spare, and and I do the uh, extraction, the um, clean and dry them, and then I back seal them in, in foil uh, sachets that we can then. Uh, feed out to um, or distribute to various uh, nurserymen that are uh, recognised uh, producers and, and distributors and the various environmental groups and government bodies that uh, need the seed. Okay, now there's just a little trial I did um, 2019 and, and another one in 2020 on germination. You can see how slow the germination is. It, it, it takes, you know, um, six months for the the very best I get was planting in September. So if you want to plant the seed, um, if it's a good, fairly good fresh seed, um, put it in in September and you'll, you, you should get it up in two months. But that's, that's the quickest that'll come up that we've um, experienced. And it can take um, six to nine months. And I've even seen um, a potting mix that's been thrown in, out on my heap lo and behold, germinate about 18 months later. Afterwards, I'd thrown it out. It actually came up in my compost. So uh, there you go. It can take a heck of a long time for these seeds to germinate. So I think the, the September planting, I think temperature germination, um, temperature is, the, is a germination trigger that they, they uh, operate under. Now, this just a word on the capsules. These are the, the capsules and how we like to extract the seed at that stage, they should be soft, yellow and ripe. And you only get about 70 or 80 out of one of those big ones and you only get 20 or thereabouts out of a little one like that. So uh, um, you, they're quite a large seed. And as you can see, they're uh, just like a little um, uh, fat heart. And um, it, when, you, when you extract the seed, if you do it in water, which I'll talk about in a second, um, you will find that the viable seed, which is fat and you know quite chubby, um, it will go to the bottom. It's quite heavy. And seed that hasn't been um, has, has grown from poor pollination or nil pollination will quite often float. So you can actually separate them by pouring these off out of a, a bucket of water. So uh, let's look at the next stage. This is how I extract them. <clears throat> I get the right mushy pods. Hold them under the running tap in a kitchen, big kitchen sieve, and um, squash all of the tissues off um, until the, uh, the seeds are exposed, and then rub them because they have a, a sticky mucilage um, coating on them. And if you can get that off, um, give it a good rub under the running water until they're nice and clean. Pick out any bits of skin that have um, uh, survived the uh, the treatment, and um, you wind up with a nice clean uh, collection of seed at the bottom of your sieve. So just accumulate that with a little bit of water and then scoop it out with a spoon, <coughs> excuse me, onto a um, kitchen uh, tissue wipe. 
and but don't leave them there to dry. Wait until they're just damp, and then scoop them off because they will stick like um, uh, glue onto the onto that tissue if you let them dry on it, and you have a lot of difficulty getting off. So scoop them off uh, when they're just damp, and then give them a dry with um, another dry towel, uh, tissue towel, and then my um, suggestion is if you put them into a paper bag at that stage and then peg them on the line in the clothes your clothesline in the shade don't leave, don't put them out in the hot sun but put them in a shady spot and they need about four to five or six days of drying out um, and bring them in at night don't don't um don't leave them out with the dew at night so you've got to get that um moisture down to about two to three percent and then after that what i do is i um, put them into foils uh, bags or foil sachets, um, heat seal them and heat vacuum seal them so that there's no air in there and they can then be stored in the refrigerator at four degrees for um, many many years. So um, that, if you don't do that you can only really use fresh seed that has just been extracted from the, um, from the pods. Um, I plant them out into uh, polystyrene trays like that. Uh, these are um, broccoli trays and it's about uh, probably 120 millimetres deep of um, best potting mix. And um, I also put uh, some dolomite in the mix and um, about 10% of washed river sand. But it does need some peat moss in it as well because some look some of the potting mixes have deteriorated in quality in, in the last couple of years. What used to be very good um, peat moss uh, brands have I've noticed got a lot more um, pine um, pine tree, uh, pine bark uh, debris in them that is uh, not properly composted, and uh, so be be discriminating when you buy your um, potting mix and try and get one that is a good quality with a lot less of that um, un uncomposted pine uh, material in it. So add a bit of peat moss, uh, washed river sand and a bit of dolomite and uh, bury the seed under about uh, eight or nine or ten millimetres of, of cover soil and then keep damp. So <clears throat> when they get up to the, to the um, four leaf stage or five leaf stage they start to throw a little tendril up looking for something to climb and that is the time to prick them out or um, separate them from that uh, seedling tray and put them out into um, I use about 120 or 140 millimeter um, pots 120s uh, are the bottom end of the range but I have to use them because I haven't got a very big shade house so uh, <clears throat> space is my problem but um, Put when when they're, they're potted out, put a um, small bamboo stake in there. It needs to be about fifty to seventy-five centimeters tall, and um, as they that will give the tendril the um, support to be able to curl its way up. And when it gets near the top, what I do is I have a, a wire right through my um, shade house uh, above the pots, and I attach a string to the top of the. Uh, the stakes and tie it onto the overhead wire so if I am held up getting them out to a, a, um, a planting location they can at least climb up the string otherwise they'll tangle into a terrible mess um, between each other and uh, when you go to take them to your planting site you'll um, be um, knocking them around very badly and breaking off the tops but if you have to do that um, it's quite okay to just get the scissors and um, prune them because that will make them multiple shoot down below and actually you do wind up with a better um, plant when you um, when you take the top off it makes them multiple shoot and you get a, a much denser plant but planting out into the into the um, field um, as you can see here dig a big hole um, put a bit a handful of dolomite in and mix that with your um, soil at the bottom of the hole and then you've got the stake there already supporting the um, the vine. Remove the vine very carefully from the pot. Try not to disturb those roots because if you disturb the roots, as I said before, 
a lot of vines will just go into shock and they they they, they just sit there and say no, i don't want to move for ages and uh, but if you do it very gently and treat them treat them kindly um, don't compact the soil around them just fill in around them and then water the soil around them as you uh, fill it up uh, to ground level and the string if you've had one on the top of the vine can then be attached to the a low branch on the support tree above it so um, it's quite a handy thing to have those strings on there what I've also found is that they just love bamboo poles. And if you've got a supply of bamboo poles, you can then enable them to get into big rainforest trees that have got first branches, say um, uh, five, five or six meters above where you couldn't normally get a, a string to, to go. And the bamboo pole, if you can get one big enough to um, stick it up amongst a couple of the um, dense branches, the, the the vine will scramble up it like a rat up a drain pipe, no problem at all. So they, they just love a bamboo pole to get entry to the canopy. Now, a few hints about planting. Um, if it's a big tree, you should always go about a metre or a metre and a half away from the trunk because big trees suck a heck of a lot of water and nutrient out of the ground and the vine will have a lot of competition trying to make headway. Uh, smaller trees, it's okay. You can put them um, maybe uh, 200, 250 uh, millimetres, 25 centimetres away from the um, small, the trunk of a small tree. Say one that's got about a, a trunk diameter of uh, uh, say 10 centimetres or more. And um, th these, are, these are fine because they, they're not being so much nutrient and water out of the ground. But um, I would also suggest um, you should go on the east southeast side of trees wherever possible try and keep it out of the sun now although that one in the photograph on the left is on the on the um, north uh, west side um, I've actually got one on the other side too you can't see but um, this one did manage to do all right because the the foliage above it still gave it reasonable um, cover but the soft leaves were up the top here and the bottom ones were down here were tough. And the only time that we really ever got caterpillars on them there was when the big ones uh, went down low to um, find a bit more uh, food there. And uh, it, I can tell you, you could hear them chewing from two meters away because those leaves were very hard. They'd been out the sun. But the big, ca the big caterpillars can't eat them. But uh, uh, up the top there, you'll always get your softer leaves where it gets into the foliage. Now, um, where to plant them? Um, trellises are a wonderful thing for school projects, for um, uh, um, parks, and for any little reserves and so on. And these trellises can be quite simple, just run some wires between some treated poles. Um, it need to be about two to two and a half meters tall and um, the, the, the vines uh, put the space the, the wires as you can see it about um, 300 millimeters apart something like that or else use a coarse mesh there. Um, the vines will soon cover them no trouble at all. Um, people ask me quite often can I put it on a fence? Well there's a fence at the end of Long Road on Mount Tambourine and it's just covered in um, a beautiful dense uh, growth of Cravenosa there and I can assure you there were caterpillars all over it um, when I looked at it a, a few a while back so uh, it was a couple of years ago so that photograph's a little bit old but um, anyway that uh, fence is quite good. Um, the ideal is to get into a, a nice uh, forest, lightly forested area where it's uh, shady but uh, reasonably open, good light and uh, just run a string or a, a bamboo pole up the side of a suitable tree and you can see that have they, they run up in no time at all. And now this, here's one here, and this was tough conditions where we had this Forestdale Logan um, Council project and it was planted way back, oh, it was about 19, uh, 2015. And these vines, despite being in the poorest soil beside Oxley Creek, um, have grown beautifully and I'm very hopeful that this will be a, um, a very nice stepping stone in the corridor between Mount Tambourine 
and the um, the Brisbane area um, as these vines continue to grow. So um, these um, plantings in the interim areas between um, isolated populations are uh, vital in, in um, forming these uh, corridors to allow the, the bird wings to move along and reinvade the uh, the Brisbane area and this is this is one of the major um, objectives of our whole project is to get them back into Brisbane so people can enjoy them there. Now just to talk uh, briefly on a project we've got um, up on the Tambourine Mountain it's the um, Shelf Road project is um, council um, land and this was started by um, Energex uh, as a carbon offset uh, uh, project about five years ago and they planted about three or four thousand rainforest trees and you can see where it, it was very sparse when we started off in 2019 and that when I say we it was Richmond Birdwing RBCN and um, Tambourine Mountain Land Care and there's uh, Judy Rowland there the, the president that's right, made this he, she's got this the, she's the engine in, in, in this great movement up on the mountain and this is uh, the last um, part of our project uh, where we've planted um, 500 vines and we put a great big trellis in this rainforest uh, revegetation area where we um, took over from the Energex project in um, 2019 and we've got 30 vines in on that uh, that uh, trellis there and they're going gangbusters at the moment so this is the sort of project we want to see our seed uh, supporting and um, hopefully there we'll see more of them all around the district and the butterfly will be there for everybody to enjoy so just as a last plug um, I need this, these um, pods. It, it's the time of year now when they should be um, ripening down on the lowlands. Um, they're a bit later up on the mountain here, but um, please, if you've got some to spare, contact me or Matt, and uh, there's my contact uh, details there, and uh, just send them in fresh if you like. Uh, in this fact, it's better to send them in as fresh pods rather than the extracted seed because uh, um, the method that I use gives us the best quality seed. I'm not saying you can't do it, but because, uh, look, some of you um, environmental groups and uh, catchment groups, you, you can extract your own seed. You know how to do it now. And if you've got the right gear, you can refrigerate it. And what I'd like to also see is some people do some trial work with, say, deep freezing it rather than just uh, refrigeration. So there's a lot of work to still look at in all these things. And also, um, possibly various um, abrasion to the seed to see whether that improves the speed that it comes up and the viability of the seed. So uh, there's still a lot to look at and uh, we'd love to have feedback from any of you people out there. So okay, thank you very much everybody. I'll go back to Matt. Thanks very much Richard. Um, yeah, you do fantastic work with the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network and up on the mountain. Um, and I guess we're touching on the on the seed note. Um, really, some in the last few years, the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network through Richard has supplied seed for 500 vines to be grown and put in place that shelf road project in Town Green that Richard just spoke about. A thousand vines for the Woodford Sanford corridor that we're putting in place ourselves. We've supplied thousands of seeds um, for the hundreds of vines reforest now in um, northern New South Wales are putting in the ground hundreds and hundreds of seeds uh, for vines that have been planted in the Logan Albert corridor um, again seeds for hundreds of vines being put in place in western Brisbane suburbs by uh, the Brisbane City Council's land for wildlife team um, hundreds of vines have gone into Ian's captive breeding facility We've provided seed for hundreds and hundreds of vines that have gone into the ACQ Water Hens Dam uh, Birdwing Butterfly Project. Um, thousands and thousands of vine seedling seeds have gone to various community nurseries um, along the Richmond Birdwing Butterflies Range. Um, and thousands of seeds have gone into thousands, a thousand vines that the Cubbler Witten Catchment Network are putting in place. So when we talk about the network requiring seed, it's not because we sell it, it's because we give it away for projects to be uh, 
cultivated and planted so vines can go out into the area. And often we have to buy those vines back from the nurseries we give the seed to. Um, so this fruit is currently ripening up at the moment. Please, pretty pleased with the cherry on top. If you have fruit and are willing to share it, um, by all means, send it through to uh, to Richard at that uh, address he gave you or give us an email at birdwing at, uh, birdwing at wildlife.org.au and we'll get that seed or fruit up to Richard on the mountain. Um, also, just a few places where you can buy seed if you wanted or buy, buy plants while we're touching on that. Uh, I know Noosa Landcare at Pomona grow a very good birdwing butterfly vine and we'll have lots in stock at the moment. Similarly, Forest Heart Nursery in Mullaney have uh, plenty of birdwing butterfly vines available to, to be purchased. The Gumbacho Community Nursery in Eaton's Hill in North Brisbane have got vines ready to go. Um, and anybody on the Gold Coast, not a whole lot of vines available for purchase on the Gold Coast. Uh, but if you drop an email to us, at, again, at birdwing at wildlife.org.au, then we'll be able to help you out in some way. All right, I guess it's time to ask answer some questions. We've been receiving quite a few during this year. And again, as I said, I apologize if we don't get to everybody's question, we'll do our best. Um, but those we don't answer live, we'll certainly answer on paper and that will be available with the download. A uh, good one here from Sarah Starbridge. I guess Ian and Richard, you could probably both answer this, but do instars feed on leaves that have pupa attached? Uh, I can answer that one, Richard, probably. They, um, they will feed on leaves if a pupa is attached to one of the food plant vines. Um, but generally in the wild, the, the caterpillars will leave uh, the host plant that it's raised on and go to a different species of plant somewhere in the neighborhood uh, close by to, to pupate. And that's probably to avoid that very thing being eaten by a, a voracious fifth instar larva. Um, it sometimes it doesn't happen, but uh, most of the time when you find pupae, which is not often because they're green and hard to find, but they will be on plants nearby, some, on some different species. So uh, generally that would be a, a situation that's avoided. Yeah, sure. No, that's fair enough too. Um, Susan Flesser has asked, and this will be a good one for you, Richard, is the species sensitive to pest control chemicals? And a pretty good question um, there, I think. Yes, that's a, a very um, You're all right, Richard, we can hear you. Keep okay, going. sorry. Uh, okay. It, yes, it is. The, you've got to be very careful with garden pesticides. Growing, growing the um, birdwing vines in your backyard um, is a very uh, hazardous thing if you use a lot of pesticides. In fact, um, they're just another caterpillar, and if you're spraying for caterpillars, uh, you've got them in your in your vegetable garden. You've got to be very careful that you don't produce any drift that may go to a nearby um, birdwing vine. And um, I use uh, a few pesticides in my um, vegetable garden, for instance, dipel, which is a, a biological disease of um, um, caterpillars. And uh, it kills white butterfly caterpillars and the cabbage moth very effectively. And it will kill bird wing butterfly caterpillars just as effectively. It just attacks and kills butterfly uh, larvae of any type. So you've got to be very careful. Yes, it's, a, it's something you must be very careful with. Yeah, the very last thing you want to do is get a, get a, a larvae chewing on a vine and, and um, have it accidentally died because of some overspray. Um, Carla Cattrall has asked a, a quick question, and maybe I can answer it. She asked, why is inbreeding depression the sole focus of the recovery effort? Um, happily, it's not. It was a big part of Ian's talk because that's the, the role he plays in this overall puzzle. But there's a lot of work going into um, community plantings, identifying strategic locations to plant vines, joining and building corridors, and really getting some connectivity between isolated populations. So. Uh, Captive rearing is one small part of a very big puzzle. So that's a, you know, it's a positive, positive process. I could probably add to that a little bit, Matt, by saying that um, we were seeing the butterfly disappear from parts of its range where it had been strong just decades earlier. So it was a bit of an emergency response too to start captive breeding for, uh, to address the inbreeding depression problems. 
as soon as we possibly could, while we knew it was going to take longer to establish the habitat in the intervening patches and uh, restore food resources, we knew this is something we could get going quickly and hopefully reverse those th rapid declines in, in places and, and get, the, get the butterfly back into places where uh, it used to be quite quickly. Yeah, it was a triage approach, I suppose, and probably the best thing that, that could happen at the time. Um, Gail Dalliston has quickly asked, is it possible to grow the vine in a large pot? Uh, i.e. a small garden. Uh, yep, absolutely. These vines love being in, in large pots. You can repot your vines up a size each time and if you get a large pot, you can stick two or three vines in a pot. As long as you've got them trailing up something, whether it be a rope or a trellis, uh, pots are okay. The only issue is uh, they limit themselves in size. If the, the vine's not going up into the canopy, then it's opportunity to produce a lot of biomass to attract a butterfly is a little bit reduced. So um, pots are good for your small garden. Certainly, but you want to get that vine as big as possible to become uh, part of a, a, a food plant for a butterfly. A couple of other questions here. Uh, Cecil Sarivia, uh, can we buy seeds from a local land care office? Uh, I don't think so. I don't know any land care offices where you can buy seed. Rather, you would have to purchase um, some plants from local nurseries. And again, we can help you out with locations for that. Um, Another question here by, from Jacinta and Ian or Richard, maybe both you can answer this. Um, she asked, might the plant have lost a seed disperser? Um, maybe the passage through the gut might improve some germination and some scarification. Uh, that relates to your comment, Richard, uh, about the abrasion. You know, what might be some of the seed dispersers um, in, in previous history, I suppose? Well, I'll answer that one, I think, Ian, but... Um there's a, there's a lot of talk about um, the fact that the group of, um, of plants that the um, Richmond Birdwing belongs to um, have a, a very long list of um, toxic compounds that are uh, in their leaves or in their uh, fruits and so on. And uh, it's quite likely that the um, Pravenosa pods are, are actually quite toxic to um, a lot of... Uh, potential eaters of you know like birds and possums etc but i think matt's actually just we were discussing earlier that he's having troubles with rats taking the uh, uh the, the the pods off his vine and uh, that's the first that i've heard of rats doing it but i i know that possums don't seem to like um pravenosa uh, pods they leave them alone whereas lahiana i have had reports that the possums relish the um the pods up on up on the um springbrook area so um uh, but what's their natural um dispersing agent i think really what we've got to do is to look at well scrub turkeys um they they definitely will pull them apart occasionally but they don't seem to have a great um, desire to uh to consume them every time they find them where I had my big vines at a previous place, um, there were many pods on the ground quite often and, and there were many scrub turkeys and they very seldom ate them all. They only occasionally took one or two. So I think that what's happened is that our, um, our, the en environment that they, we're now growing them in doesn't have natural um, dispersal agents. There may have been probably cassowaries in, in the geological past and uh, that were uh, the major spreaders of seed like they are up north. Um, but uh, birds don't normally touch them and um, only the scrub turkey have, has, has ever been recorded eating them. So uh, we've, we've got to do the job for them. Yeah, the, um, the dirty rats are breaking my heart, Richard. I've raised these... Flowers, got them germinated, looked after this little fruit for months now. Finally, they become ripe, and before I pick them, something gets to them. It's breaking my heart. But anyhow, everybody's got to eat, I, I suppose. Well, that's um, nature. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a couple of other questions. I realise we've gone over time, so I'll just answer a couple more. Um, Melly Mott has asked, can members of the public subscribe to the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network for information? Yes, absolutely. It is a membership-based organisation, so via the Wildlife Queensland website, 
You can become a member of the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network. That way you'll be kept up to date on a whole range of important information through our, our newsletter. Um, and you have access to all the committee members, Richard, Ian, uh, myself, lots of other experts to answer questions. Um, so please do that. It's a great little, uh, a great little um, project and, and we need your support. Um, and Amanda Maggs has asked about coral linkages between Logan and Brisbane shires. Are there any particular suburbs to focus on um, to plant sites or plant vines in and, and do we need more sites along Osley Creek catchment? Uh, I guess that's a lot of what I do. And yes, most certainly um, as many sites as physically possible between Mount Tambourine and Sanford in that, in that area would be fantastic. Uh, following Tambourine, Mountain northwards along the Albert Valley is a good way to go. Skipping across somehow to Oxley Creek catchment would be fantastic. And then linking up with the western suburbs of Brisbane is, is a really key corridor project um, that we'll get to eventually. All of our corridor projects though are slow burns. The, you know, these vines from what we've learned today take a while to get up and established. So um, all of these corridor planting projects are a 20 year project plus, And that's probably the time frame that we'd probably start to see some success. So. Everybody who puts vines in the grounds need to be quite patient. Um, I think that's probably about it, uh, everybody. We've answered plenty of questions here this morning. Like I said, those of you who haven't had your questions answered, uh, we will get get that to you via, uh, via the downloadable presentation. But I guess I'd like to thank both uh, Ian and Richard for their time this morning and giving us all the information that they can present on the Richmond Birding Butterfly. There is so much more to talk about on this subject. We just can't cram it into the time that we've got today. Uh, but again, if you're keen or interested, please um, get in touch with the Richmond Birding Conservation Network through the Wildlife Queensland website and we'll, we'll help you out as best as possible. Um, there are in fact three fact sheets available from the Richmond Birdwing Conservation Network page on the Wildlife Queensland website. The fact sheets are on the butterfly itself on the Birdwing Butterfly Vine and on cultivating the vine. And those fact sheets are um, incredibly detailed, well presented and, and extremely useful resources. I encourage everybody to get, get uh, a hold of a downloaded copy of those particular fact sheets. Um, I've been asked to let everybody know that there will be a quick survey that pops up at the end of this presentation. We would encourage as many of you as possible to please take a few minutes to fulfill that survey out. It's very important to us that we learn about um, what types of subjects you would like to hear in future webinar series. Um, and again, there'll be a link emailed to everybody who's registered to listen to this webinar tomorrow. That will be a link to the content, uh, to the recording and to the PowerPoint slides for you to have a quick look at at your leisure in, in, uh, in the future. And please let your friends and family and other people know that this was on and they can have a look at it via the website. Uh, I think that's about it today. So I guess we'd like to once again, just thank Ian and Richard for their time. And for the rest of you, get out, plant some vines. Have a great day. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.